Today's episode is sponsored by Squarespace. What's worse than dying on the toilet? Yep, messing up 8x10 sheet film. And while I'm well on my way to the former, there's also plenty of the latter in today's video. And now that I'm film photography canceled for making a video about a digital camera, let's throw all caution to the wind by doing a traditional burning of some cash in the most extreme way we can besides literally lighting it on fire. 8x10 is truly a format that has existed and still exists. Why? I don't know. Ansel Adams definitely seemed to like it. It's humongous. 50 something times the resolution of 35 mil film and that detail in frame can be, you know, pixel peeped or I guess grain gawked quite extensively. That and the depth of field on 8x10 is, you know, just something out of a dream. The short and simple of it is that when you expand the format size, you also extend the focal length and it can deliver this very shallow and isolating depth of field look. I mean, that sounds pretty cool. So why doesn't everyone shoot it? Oh, you naive, uneducated, and classless bitch. It's expensive. And more often than not, it is downright risky to shoot this format. The cameras to shoot this format also are quite expensive, which makes f all sense to me because they're just light type boxes that can move a little. Well, maybe one day someone at Intrepid had a kind of similar thought, you know, probably while completely shit house drunk at the local dive or at the pub, I guess, since they're based out of Britain. And well, yeah, they decided to do something about it. And the whole film community erupted in applause. With 3D printing technology and cost-effective plywood emerging onto the scene, Intrepid took the bull by its haunches and started producing more economical versions of, you know, 4x5 and 8x10 cameras for the masses. But it kind of comes at a cost, and that cost would be quality, you might think. Today we're going to be taking a look at the 8x10 Black Edition that Intrepid kindly sent over for me to do abusive things to in the field. And yeah, fair warning, I'm not going to be pulling my punches just because they sent me this either. There's definitely some shit that goes sideways. So with the Intrepid and everything I need for 8x10 packed away in the car, except my light meter, because at this point it's tradition for me to just totally forget it, my buddy Caleb and I headed up to Lake Isabella to shoot some Lake is a bangers. Our first stop, of course, the motel, because it was literally hotter than hell itself outside. I think there's something living in here. <laughs> That's locked. After some, you know, light goofing off, we hopped in the car to check out some locations as the sun was really starting to get to that, you know, good lighting, anything looks good at magic hour, you'd really have to be a dumbass here to f it up phase. Our first location was out in the back country, you know, quite a bit. We'll call it uh, Fire Ants Attacking Penis Hill for no reason at all. Anyway, after resisting the urge to shoot a photo of, you know, garbage like usual, we scouted the rest of Fire Ants Attacking Penis Hill. I don't know, there's not a lot here. There's potentially something over there that could be really cool on color. But I think the question is, do I want to blow my uh, one of my two color photos? Expensive ass ectochrome. That trash pile back there was kind of cool too. Am I going to be able to get out of here again? I don't know. I mean, I guess there's no skeletons down here. Big ass fire over there. I don't know what it what that's about. I'm going to go check out that spot over there and see what we got. This could be a cool shot. I thought from a distance it looked like these were like red balloons that had like flown away and gotten tangled in the barbed wire. I don't think this location is going to yield anything. Got probably another hour and a half before the sun goes down, so keep looking. Anyway, after a medical incident involving some insects, we left that location in search of the next one. <sighs> All right, I think we found a good location. Several barns are being lit up very nicely. I'm just going to bring all my 8x10 shit and uh, figure it out. Sound good? Good. Sounds great. Thanks, dog. Oh, there's an ant on this too. <laughs> off. There's definitely a lot of gear involved with 8x10 from the lenses, the tripod, the camera, the film holders, shutter release cable, etc. And it's all, you know, pretty heavy and large. I mean, what do you expect shooting something called large format? I will say though that one of the huge benefits of the Intrepid system is that it is incredibly lightweight, if not the most lightweight uh, 8x10 camera out there currently coming in at about six pounds. It's a field camera after all. So like, you know, what Garfield said, it's meant to be dragged out into the field and shot. How are we looking here? 50, still a little far away. While 3D parts are definitely found on this, I would say that actually uh, very light and sturdy aluminum is uh, makes up most of the build. It's pretty lightweight, I guess is what I'm saying. I didn't really get a chance to test out the aerodynamics of it myself, but I'm pretty sure this damn thing would become airborne if, you know, given enough wind.
found a comp like six years later. This location was a little bit harder than expected to get to, but I think I can make it work. Ah, oh, shit, I left the lenses in the car. This Intrepid actually operates on a system that requires you to screw in the front standard to one of three, I guess, pilot holes. It's not really the fastest setup and there is some potential for error here if you're not you know, somewhat familiar with, I guess, focal length and bellow extension. To be fair though, there is some room to play with the focus knob and kind of cover some overlap if you get one of the pilot holes wrong, but you might as well take the time for your lens beforehand and you know, figure out the right hole. Trust me, it's a skill you'll need. It'll probably come up again in other facets of life. Cool, lens time. There it is, there's the 50. There you go. It's a bit of a heavy lens. Let's see how the system, how well it holds it. One of the main reasons that I said, hell yeah, partner, to testing out one of these Intrepids was because the uh, front standard accepts Sinar boards, of which all my 8x10 lenses are currently mounted to. Speaking of mounting and other sexual stuff, the back uses magnets or some engineering shit I don't understand to hold it in place. And it even allows you to rotate it for landscape or vertical. So that's kind of cool. But you know, if you're anything like me, which you should try not to be, it'll likely just stay horizontal. I should really have a dark cloth for this. Maybe a little bit of front tilt might help. It looks pretty good wide open. All right, we got the shot. Let's put the yellow filter on. Can you tell it's been a while since I've shot 8x10? All right. We're shooting some Cat Labs X80, I think it's called. Everything's locked down. Nothing's going nowhere. This is the part I'm not such a fan of. Putting the uh, film holder in the back. Ah, oh, it's not so bad, I guess. It does wiggle the camera a little bit, which makes me a little uncomfortable because I'm shooting it so wide open. Am I doing this wrong? Do I have to force it? Yeah, so this is gonna be a recurring thing in this video. The back of the system is a traditional spring back system, and historically it's been a good enough system, but I'd say mostly for smaller formats, like four x five, the AP10 film holder is just, you know, it's fucking massive and trying to jam it into a spring tension back, just it's a little bit of a task, especially because the camera itself sacrifices some overall sturdiness through its, you know, cost effective build. It'd be nice to have a, uh, what are they called? Uh, ba a bail back. The thing is, I feel like I moved the camera again. Let's do a uh, one, one twenty fifth F8. Well, it's easier to get out. <laughs> I feel like there's a life lesson there somewhere. So the photo, it's okay. I do like the shallow depth of field, but honestly, maybe I do wish I closed down a bit more at the risk of, you know, getting some more motion blur in the foreground grass and in the uh, trees back here. I also wish these fence posts weren't here. I was kind of hoping the long lens and, you know, format size would blur the sh out of it so they wouldn't really be visible, but it didn't work. So I guess I'll just go f myself. The shadows are a little bit cooked too, which makes the subject here kind of disappear in frame a little bit, whatever. This photo ultimately accomplished what I needed it to. So all good here. I think I just needed something to get that, you know, first one out of the way. Think of it kind of like being rejected by a girl. The first one's always the hardest, but you know, the hundred times that follow certainly get a little easier. Feel like the light is going. Got a lot of <laughs> 50 mil right there might be good. There's a lot, there's some nice. Oh, you know what? Let's back it up a little. Hmm. 50 right here will look great. I really don't mind the setup on uh, on the Intrepid. It's not bad. When you're racing against the light though, kind of sucks. I think we have our composition. Wish I brought my light meter, but I'm too stupid. Calabs, ADI ISO. See if I can put this in better. Go if it goes in straight. I think that's the key. All right, intrepid. Bail back. Get in there. I don't think it's all the way in. No, it's not. There you go. Camera probably moved, but it's maybe returned to its position. I don't know. 
the lies I tell myself to uh, feel better about the fact I'm about to shoot 8x10 and I'm not 100% on the composition. 130th F11. Easy. So why would you ever want to shoot 8x10? Honestly, I asked myself the same question when I saw this photo that looks like absolute roadkill that clearly shit itself before impact. Well, I guess if you enjoy the process of film and how it kind of forces you to slow down and be a little bit more specific, then what can I say? 8x10 takes that feeling and doubles down through cost limitations and just, you know, the absurd amount of gear that you need for it. The truth is 8x10 is great and it's certainly very rewarding when you, you know, get it right. But there's also definitely a lot of risk involved. Think of it kind of like the Martingale system. It only really works if you have unlimited money and no limits to throw at it. Realistically, you're probably going to mess up a few times, you know, learning the ropes and just making dumb little errors that are kind of costly. But I do suppose the Intrepid camera itself kind of cuts down on those costs costly errors just a little bit by presenting the format as a more affordable option up front. Anyway, this photo is ass. I was certainly going for a little underexposure, putting the mid-gray tone on the light that was bouncing off these old gas pumps, but I don't know, this is advanced darkness. And whether it was dev or scanning or just underexposure, something clearly shit the bed at damn near terminal velocity. As we called it for the evening, we were driving back to the motel and passed by this huge neon sign that would have been, you know, photography sacrilegious to not shoot. So me pretending like I had any competence, I set up for the shot in damn near complete darkness, all while the motel owner kept an eye on us while polishing their shotgun. I was also feeling a little freaky that night and was gonna try fill the frame with some flash action considering how contrasty the setting was gonna be and how much uh, Kodak Ektachrome doesn't really like that. All right, good enough. It's only Ektachrome on 8x10. It's one of the most expensive things you can shoot, but whatever. Did I pull the dark slide? No. This is hard, man. Okay. Timer's going for about 54 seconds. Let's pop a flash real quick. That was pretty bright. I think I got that. I think that might be blown out. Time. Cool. Dude, it is gonna be a Miracle if this shot turns out. <laughs> yeah, so I didn't even bother scanning this one. To be honest with you, the money that I used to not only buy the sheet film to take this photo and develop it would have actually been a better service if I had just, as I mentioned before, lit it on fire. Then in that case, I would have actually gotten something from it, like warmth. I actually thought for sure this shot would be overexposed, if anything, like damn near nuclear. While underexposed may not really be the right terminology here, it's pretty damn underexposed anyway. That's on me. I up and someone should probably tell my mom that she raised a complete and utter failure. I'd like to take another shot at this one day. I've actually learned a lot about ectochrome and flash settings in the past couple of weeks and I actually think I could nail the damn thing if I had another stab. Speaking of stabbing, it was time to get the hell out of there before we were. So we headed to the motel and did a bunch of immature photography nerd shit all night. Oh wow, that's a crazy ass ring bro. Dude, that's insane! Okay. I think I've fired this flash more times than actually used it. <laughs> Next morning we woke up early for sunrise, aka the only temperate part of the day, after Caleb chugged a cough stir, which of course is a gas station Butterfinger coffee mixed with a monster energy drink and a little bit of lean. We were definitely super talkative at our next location. <laughs> this location we had definitely been to before, but not quite under these circumstances. There was a nearby fire making everything super hazy and orange, like the skies around Mount Doom. Which, by the way, Mount Doom? Really? That shit is such a cheesy ass name. Obviously they're doing evil there. Anyway, just like Sauron, I wanted to slay and commit total genocide against these 8x10 sheets. Maybe this is the shot, because I mean, this facade of the house looks nice. You got a mountain back there the light's gonna start coming down and it's kinda like foggy. The only problem is, I've done it before and it was okay. So I kinda wanna see if I can do something new this time. I think I found the comp. I hope the, the light's gonna hit it. Actually, I didn't even think about that. It might not. Looking at the light up on the mountain, it looks like it is hitting it from the side. I should get the camera set up anyway. I'm gonna have to uh, 
use the 35, I think. Sorry, when I when I say 35, I mean uh, the 240 lens board does not seem to want to fit in here very well. Oh, shit. Don't fall out. I kind of like this lens. I think it's because it's a 3D printed lens board. Maybe it's like it, a little too thick and the Intrepid doesn't like that. Oh yeah, maybe that's better. Ooh. Yeah, it's a good frame. I think uh, it's gonna have to be ectochrome. I mean, it's gotta be color, right? It's not color, what are you doing? What are you waking up early for sunrise for? Didn't sleep great last night. Our room was just kind of a swamp. I kinda understand what, uh, why Lord Farquaad wanted to, uh, I wonder if I can use a little bit of tilt to get some of the foreground in focus. One of these knobs on the front does tilt. I'm thinking it's the outside one. Oh, fuck me. What is going on? Why can't we just peace and love, baby? Come on. Damn it. Yeah, no, it just does not want to go. Ah, that's frustrating. I might have to switch lenses at the last second. I can't get it. I gotta switch to the 50. Fine, this shot is gonna change quite a bit. Racing against the light here. The light's already down. What the f Let the rear cap on. Gotta change this now too, because I switched lenses. I wonder if I can get some tilt. Let's try the tilt real quick. So let's place a temporary hold on all the lens drama happening that morning that was giving me an ulcer and address this because it is without a doubt one of my favorite parts of the Intrepid system. Tilt and rise are separate knobs on this system and can be controlled independently of each other. And as an American, I'm all about independence. Seriously, good job here, Intrepid. It is really nice to be able to control tilt so fluidly, especially with such a heavy ass lens. And then, you know, the cherry on top of this whole thing is the satisfying click stop when tilt is returned back to zero. This is a feature that is not actually found on my other, much more expensive 8x10 camera, and it frustrates the hell out of me sometimes. It's a pretty specific tool that I consider to be kind of a luxury on an 8x10 camera, and the fact that this Intrepid has it is kind of a win. That looks sexy. That was actually easy. The tilt, the tilt was nice. With the lighting about to touch down on the house and after, you know, hawk tooing on my filter. Okay. It was finally time to take a photo that morning. Do an ectochrome. Doing this again, huh? I don't even know if I'm still pointed at the damn thing. Intrepid. Bailback. F22, one second, okay. Yeah, that'll work, okay. Pull the dark slide. So yeah, I didn't even bother scanning this one either, and here's why. Let's get this out of here. Oh, is this not even, ah, uh, That last one might have light leaks. That's right, in my ongoing war with the 8x10 spring back, things had clearly escalated to the point of no return, of course with my only other sheet of ectochrome. The film holder was somehow just not seated properly and leaked light all over the place, like oil from my car. So let's take a moment, not of silence, but of rage, and talk about how a bailback system would potentially solve all this. Here's the one on my Ghibellini 8x10 camera. It opens and allows you to glide the holder in before you close it and seat it. It's incredible. You don't have to jam anything in anywhere. It's not like a sandwich that you're shoving in your annoying ass neighbor's mail slot. Okay. Regroup, reconquer. All right. This isn't a bad angle too. 50 might be a little tight. I gotta move back, I think. I guess that's not bad, but we need to move again. Get that in focus. Let's see what we can do about the foreground and background with the tilt. There's the background and foreground. That was easy. The tilt mechanism on this is just absolutely wonderful. I wish I had that on my other camera. I guess there's no such thing as a perfect 8x10 camera. Here we go. My favorite part. There's gotta be a trick to this. Looks like about 1 30th at F11. Kandusville baby doll. With the draw of the dark slide. Okay. 
All right, this photo is excellent in my opinion. Not a portfolio shot probably, but I'll rethink on it once some time has passed. I do like the detail on it and something I did not mention as well was that I used some swing to try and get the you know, fallen dead tree over here as well as the subject of the shot in focus. I think it actually worked well because the sharp silhouette of this tree kind of guides your eye more or less to the house and, you know, to the window. And I don't know how well that would have overall worked if it, you know, was thrown out of focus. In the future, I'd probably close down a little bit more, but otherwise I really like the shot for what it is. You know, the lighting and the ambient haze certainly do help. One more shot. I don't know if it'll be any good, but at least it's something different. There we go. Okay, I think that was the best one so far, uh, but it is also not all the way in. Ah, oh, moved it. Okay. Get out of here. F11, uh, 1 15th. Oh, this shot is also quite good i think honestly it's the good angled lighting that's doing most of the heavy lifting either way one note i'd have for myself is the same thing you know just close down more in the photo and in my personal life there is some blur going on here and there but it's whatever kind of a cool detail but speaking of details it's all about them, which is a perfect and incredibly smooth segue for me to thank today's sponsor, Squarespace, for their ongoing support. So you have some piping hot off the griddle 8x10 photos to throw into your portfolio, huh? Well, how is anyone going to see your fresh new work if it's not online? Good question. Luckily for you, there is an easy way to get your portfolio onto a website and available to the masses so you can start commissioning work, being hired as a photographer, or even selling your prints of your work. Let me introduce you to Squarespace. It's an all-in-one website building platform that features the ability to truly unlock your creative potential. Start with one of hundreds of professionally designed templates or even get started building the website of your dreams with something called blueprint ai a new feature in squarespace's building toolkit blueprint ai is an automated way to generate the foundation of your website by answering a few simple questions at the get-go and letting the algorithm figure out the rest for you with 1.4 billion potential design combinations and the brand new fluid engine a sleek new way to drag and drop elements of your website wherever at your disposal you can build the website of your dreams faster than ever before i've been using squarespace for several years now and it's been a wonderful tool for me to display my portfolio online as well as as my commissioned work. When friends and family ask to see some of my shots, I usually send them straight to my website. So what are you waiting for? If you're ready to build a website, you can start a free trial today at squarespace.com slash grainy days. And if you use the code grainy days at checkout, you can get 10% off your first purchase. So in the end is the intrepid for you. Here's what daddy thinks. This thing is quite good. It has some of the features you would want from like a premium eight x 10 camera, like, you know, separate rise and tilt knobs and you know, sturdy enough build quality. At the end of the day, it's just a light type box, right? Some have more features than others and some just keep it simple. This one more or less leans to the ladder, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. To be honest with you, I think if this eight x 10 camera came with a bailback system, even if it cost a little bit more a purchase, then I think the Intrepid eight x 10 would become a true powerhouse contender in the eight x 10 arena. This camera isn't a bad option if you're new to 8x10 and looking to break into it without completely breaking the bank as long as you you know understand some of the pitfalls attached to the model i truly don't know about long-term quality and you know how long these things will last in the field being used constantly but i do imagine it will last long enough for you to shoot with it a couple times and realize you fucking hate 8x10 there are of course a bunch of other features i didn't cover like bubble levels fine focus knob and i think even the bellows are magnetically attached so you can swap them out if you want what's up next for intrepid who knows? Whether it's lenses, ultra large format, or bail backs, either way, I'm excited to see what they do next. But speaking of backs, it's time for me to bail.